Coming to you from Byram, Mississippi, is a church where every member matters. It's Lakeshore Church, and we are so glad for you to join us this morning. The message comes from Senior Pastor Jay Frazier as he shares from God's Word. Our goal is that everyone find a place to serve God in and outside the church. We worship and celebrate our relationship with God and strive to bring others to the cross of salvation. And now we join Pastor Jay Frazier. We welcome you to Lakeshore Church. It's unique that we have the opportunity to come to where you are. And so through this ministry, uh, we trust that you will sense and know God's presence in your life. And we just count it a privilege and an honor to be a part of your life today. So enjoy. Would you give a Lakeshore welcome? And it's really, she's already home. But let her know as she comes to the platform, Miss Grace Self, would you welcome her today? Grace, how did we get here today? Well, um, I went this past spring break on a mission trip for SLI, which is a student leadership institution that MRA offers. I had the privilege of going. And so it's, I've been in the SLI for two years now. And so this past spring break, we got to go to San Francisco and it was a life-changing experience. The first two days, we had to say that we were, we were on a culture group and we were studying different cultures. We couldn't share the gospel. And that was really tough for me because I was like, why am I here? Why am I over here and I can't say my faith? And we, were, we, we could say our faith if they asked us, but we couldn't go up to them and say and share the gospel of Jesus. And so the first two days were just, and my, my first impression were pointless. And later that night, uh, a girl stood up, wasn't my best friend at the time, but now we're really close and she's one of uh, the people I love most. But she said, y'all have, y'all are saying that y'all aren't doing anything, but where's your urgency of sharing the gospel at home? Because I think when we, in Mississippi, we live under this Bible belt that we think everyone is a Christian, but just as people are lost at California, there's people lost in Mississippi. And we should share and have the urgency to share the gospel just as we have the urgency right now back at home. And that just really hit me, and it really was a heart-wrenching statement. And the next couple of days, we finally got to share the gospel to people. And the last day, on, it was the Monday, my group got to go to a coffee shop. So we went to the coffee shop. I saw a woman sitting there, and I was like, I need to talk to this woman. So I went up to her, I talked to her about 20 or 30 minutes, was a great conversation, and my whole group was standing around this man. And so when I said goodbye to the woman, I went over to my group, and the man was like, can I go, can we go outside, I want to pray for y'all. And he started praying for us, and he, then he started saying grace. Well, I, my first thing was God's grace. But then I looked up, he was like, I just want to pray for grace right now. She's going to do amazing things. And I looked up, and he was looking dead at me. And it was just amazing because I didn't even tell him my name. I didn't even look his way, and he was saying my name. And he was like, take your sunglasses off. And he said, Grace, you're going to do amazing things. And I just got chill bumps all over me. I was shocked. And he looked to the whole group. He was like, y'all just don't understand. She's going to do amazing things in this life. I, I feel like I'm standing next to a celebrity right now. And it was just so amazing to me because... He was prophesizing over me and just kept on prophesizing. And later, a leader in my group said that he said that Michael is coming to your group and I need to pray for him because he'll be a prayer warrior and he'll protect my time. So I'm still praying for Michael. I'm still waiting on him because he will protect my time. I have no idea what that means. And she said also that some of my mission field will be through athletics. And it was just so amazing. That's and wild. as soon as he said that to me, I knew I've always loved public speaking, and I've always had a little thought in the back of my head saying, maybe I can do it, maybe I can become evangelism and become an evangelist. But it became real when he said that. Like, out of everyone in the group, that, that is so wonderful. He picked out me and said, you're going to do amazing things in this life, and you're going to be an evangelist. And that's what I'm called to do, is to be an evangelist. How about that? Isn't that good stuff? You can celebrate that. That's all right. You can tell God's in this, can't you? You can already tell it, and uh, she wants to share that, so it's yours. Okay, so one of the statements that I heard over spring break was very powerful to me. 
And it says, when all we see is pain, we lose sight of what God has planned for us. And that's so true to me. Because God, we will go through tough times. We will go through darkness. We will go through pain. And when we go through those times, we focus on it. We focus on ourselves and, and how bad we're hurting. But we lose sight of Jesus. And that's so true because when something bad happens to us, we think he did it to us. And he's putting through this tragedy for a reason. But we lose sight that God is there, open with wide arms, saying, you're not alone. I'll do this for you. Like, I will help you through this tough time. And that's so true to me. Because if we focus on our darkness, we lose sight of Jesus. But if we go a whole different route and focus on Jesus, he will enable us to walk on water. Amen. Amen. And I want y'all to pick two people. Two people you absolutely love. Two people you do anything for. That no matter what, you adore them no matter what. You got those two people? One of them has to go to hell. One of them has to go to heaven. Your choice. Your choice. You have to pick. And if you're like me, I'm like, take me. I'd rather them experience the glory of God than for, for me to choose one of them go to hell. Take me. John 3.16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have eternal light. God doesn't want us to suffer. God didn't want tragedy. God didn't want sin. But he is so wonderful. He's so amazing that he can make any tragic thing beautiful. He wants us to choose him over the heartbreak, over our suffering, because I believe pain and suffering are two very different things. Pain is always there. Suffering is a choice. And so he wants to heal all our wounds with love because he, is, he loves us so much and he's fond of each and every one of us. Amen. And when we run away and we choose other gods over him, we lo- we, he still pursues us. He still is knocking at the door, maybe ringing a doorbell once or twice. But we have to open the door and let him into our lives through the tragic things. He sent Jesus for us because he loves us that much. And that's what a relationship is. That's what love is. No matter what, because we get so messed up on what a relationship is, that what anyone would do for us, but we forget that God did something so amazing for us that no one could ever do. He sent Jesus. He sent Jesus to save us. That's what love is. Because love heals all wounds. And love will always leave a mark on us. Whether it's mentally, physically, or spiritually, it will always will. And one of my favorite verses is 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrong. Love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. It always trusts, always protects, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. I love love. I love talking about love. I love love stories. (coughs) And not the cheesy ones that some people make up. But love is so powerful and important to me. Because God shows, if you think about it, God shows us love in everything. In a game-winning moment, in a laugh with your best friend, and a deep converse, conversation that makes you feel good inside. Love is always there. And sometimes we think it's so hard to love. Maybe it is in a relationship, but not just to random people. It's so easy to show people love. Romans 12, 9, love must be sincere. Hate, is, hate what, what is evil. Cling to what is good. If you think about it, hating people is so easy. It takes people uh, years and so much time to plan hate, like 9-11 or wars or anything tragic that happens. But what is so beautiful that God makes tragic things beautiful is because when a tragic thing happens, like hurricane or wars, it takes seconds for people to come together and show love to to people that they barely even know. And that's just so beautiful to me. John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. God chooses us in everything. Why can't we choose him? And 
I love people so much and I love so deeply. I don't know why I was made that way. But all through my years that, well, if it's only been 17, but <laughs> all through my years, I've always chose my friends because I love them so much. And when we go, I believe our pathway is like mountains and valleys and rivers. And for me, I'm following Jesus through those mountains, valleys, and rivers. And sometimes I'm like, I'll go this way, Jesus. I just want to go this way. Maybe this looks a little bit easier. I'll just, I'll just go this way. And then I fall and scrape my knee. And I'm like, Jesus, come help me. But he runs over there with a big smile on his face. He picks me up and he says, child, I believe in you. Follow me. This is a much easier way. You will have bumps. You will fall down sometimes. But I will pick you up over and over again. And I will keep you on the path to where you're supposed to go. And I'm like, why did I have to be an evangelist? Why did I have to be such a, this hard life? And he's, and I'm just like, where am I going, Lord? Why am I going this way? Why can't I go this way? And he's so amazing to remind me. He says, don't worry about the destination, my child. Enjoy this beautiful journey that I put you on. Wow, wow. And you may feel abandoned. You may feel alone. But God has, is, and always will be there through every tragic through every painful situation he will not leave you he will not forsake you because he did not do that he allowed it to happen so he knows that we must trust in him we must submit to him to make the tragic thing beautiful and through that is love and in California they people fill their void with different gods and different sins and different worldly desires just like us but God still pursues us. He's still knocking at that door, waiting for us. And that's so true. Because no matter what we go through in life, we are strong enough to handle it. He will not leave us through that bad situation because he loves us so much. And when I think about how do I show love today, one good thing can change the whole universe to me. Because what you do matters. How you love matters. Because love will heal all wounds. Thank you. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you, Grace. When I was 18 years old, I was scared my pastor would call on me to pray during the offering. Wouldn't you say God has his hand on this young lady? Wonderful. Wonderful. It does bless my heart. Um, I, I feel, sort of feel like the indigestion after a good meal after hearing that. You know what I'm talking about? Anyhow, if you have a copy of God's Word, we want to continue today along the lines of, of the calling. And um, that, that God calls, but our responsibility is to pick up the phone. Uh, it can ring all day long. You can know it. Uh, if you're here today, and we've got visitors that came to be here for, for grace and, and uh, to hear that. But if you're here today, regardless of where you are in your spiritual journey, as, as she alluded to a moment ago, God is in the calling business. Uh, call us out of sin into righteousness into a relationship with Jesus. But God is also in the calling business. Uh, we refer to a lot of stories like that, uh, that God still is. That the population is growing. If it's more today than it's ever been, and it is in the world, I believe God's calling more, not less. Now, I believe we can be smarter. I believe because of technology, we can reach more people more effectively. But it still comes down to relationships that we have with people and therefore have with God. So we want to get into that, uh, uh, just, just really just piggyback, if you will, piggyback on what, what Grace already shared with us today. Romans chapter number 11, verses 28 and 29. If you're able, would you stand with us and honor God's word? Regarding the gospel, they are enemies for your advantage. In other words, from the Jew rejecting Christ for us to hear about Jesus, about God. But regarding election, they are loved because of the patriarchs. And then in the Holman, it says a verse that you might not be familiar with, but we'll, we'll frame it. It says, since God's gracious gifts and calling are irrevocable. The King James says the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. God knows what he's doing is the thing. Our gifts when we're saved, the, he, Paul wrote in Ephesians. So God grants us gifts upon salvation that we're supposed to operate in the body of Christ, but also calling. When God placed a call on our life that you've heard today from grace, and I have one and there's others in this room, when God places callings on our life for us to do something for him, whether it's seasonal or, or our entire life, God knows what he's talking about. He knows what he's doing. 
And for us to debate it, we're just backing up. What we need to do is obey the call of God. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord. Simply, I'll ask you, God, for my words to be your words. I thank you for what we've already heard today. And God, my prayer, you know, for this, this time, for several weeks now, God has been for that one that you want to arrest their spirit today. You want to show them like you've shown grace. and Lord, others, including myself, you want to show them that you have more territory for them if they'll just obey you. It might scare them to death, but you're in control. And God, we live in that every day. Lord, I thank you that the gifts and calling of God are without repentance, that you know what you're doing. And God, we, we come under that obedience today. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for what you'll do. Simply, God, bring glory and honor to yourself. We'll praise you now and forevermore in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen, amen. You may be seated. Listen, God's always spoken to people. Let me tell you a quick story. Uh, this is one of the horrors as a pastor, okay? Uh, right when I moved here, and I won't name name, might do it at 11 o'clock. She'll be here probably. A young lady that's almost out of high school herself. And uh, right when I moved here, first week or two, they, they wanted me to share with her, uh, talk to her about accepting the Lord. And basically, I did such a pitiful job, she went and got in her mama's lap and cried, okay? It was that bad. Well, I had a, a situation in Georgia years ago where this young boy, he was probably 8 or 9, 10 years old at the time, and I, I think maybe 10 or 11, he was coming to the altar just regularly. And people would pray with him, people would try to lead him to the Lord, nothing really happened. His mom and dad were so concerned about it that they wanted me to sit down and speak to him. And, and basically when I got to the point about God speaking to him and the calling of God for salvation in his life, it was like it was a blank page. I told him, I, I mentioned to him, I said, listen, tell me, let me tell you what's going to happen. God is drawing you to himself. It's happening. God's awakening you to, to Christ. I said, but the day's going to come that God's going to knock on your heart's door and you're going to sense his voice and you're just going to know it. And, and, you know, it's so tough sometimes to articulate to somebody what that means. You're going to know it. And when you know it, I don't care if it's in the middle of the night. I don't care if it's in the middle of the day. You call me and I'll come and you and I will just, we'll sit and pray and we'll see what God does. He said, okay, Brother Jay. Went out and told his mom and dad. His mom and dad asked him, said, how's it going? And they said, don't worry, Brother Jay, and I got it covered. They came to me and they were sort of offended. And I told them what I said. And they said, okay. And listen, he quit coming to the altar. He was waiting. He was waiting on the call of God. That's what Brother Jay told. We go to youth camp. At that youth camp at that time, we would take younger people. In the year before, he got so homesick. He's the only child. He got so homesick, his mom had to come get him from camp. The first night of camp, I didn't have a youth pastor at that time. That's how long ago it was. And, and I'd taken them all down to camp. And, and I had youth workers. I had adults that were there and chaperones. And, and the first worship service, now it wasn't even preaching. They were just singing some, doing some worship. And, and, and all of a sudden, one of our, my youth workers come up to me and said, well, he's doing it again. And, and I'm going to leave name out because this will go out. But he, she said, he's doing it again. Said he's crying and he's just, it looks like he's homesick and we're going to have to call his mama again this year. And he said, but he looked up at me and he said, I want to see Brother Jay. And so I walked down there. She's thinking he's crying. You know, he's already homesick, first worship service. And I walked to him. I called him by name and I said, what is it? And I'll never forget. He looked up at me and tears run down his face. And he said, he's speaking. And I said, so let's go take care of this. And we, went, we, left, that, we left that chair just like you're sitting in. And we went down. We were standing up worshiping. And we went down right in the middle of the worship time. All the folks up there singing, and we knelt down at an altar just like this, and I had the privilege of leading him to the Lord because God was speaking. Listen, I want to remind you of something. We don't get right on our timetable. We get right with God on his timetable. And see, God is in the speaking business. God still dials the phone. God still rings the phone, but it's up to you and me to pick up the phone. And listen, don't pass me off now if you've been saved because it comes from other callings too. God's got special things that he wants us to do on a given time, and God expects us to pick up the phone. Listen to me carefully. Awareness is not answering. Ringing is not answering. Acknowledging that the phone is ringing is not answering. Or even ignoring that the phone is ringing is not answering. I think there's a lot of things today that we've substituted for answering the phone. We feel good because we came to church. We feel good because we're doing this, that, or the other. But what God has always wanted for us is obedience. And to be obedient, we got to pick up the phone. And our first sign of obedience in our life is letting him be the, the savior of our life. I want to share with you some thoughts along these lines when I think about picking up the phone. Four aspects, if you will. And we'll just go through that. You've already heard some good preaching today from, from Grace. But here it is. Number one is there's a call for all. 
When I think about that he is speaking or we pick up the phone, there's a call for all. There's a call for all of us to be saved. He didn't die for some. He died for, for some. He died for all. Whosoever will, let him call upon the name of the Lord and he shall be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name. He stands and knocks, Revelation 3.20 says. You know what's neat about Revelation 3.20 if you go and look at the context when it was written? It wasn't, really, it wasn't written for lost people. It was written for people that had gotten away from God, a church age, and it says if we recognize that we're away from God and we hear his voice and we understand his knock, if we'll open the door, he'll come in. Now, I think it works for salvation. It works for us to understand that when somebody needs the Lord and they're not saved, that God stands at the door and knocks and we hear his voice and we open the door, he'll come in. Oh, and we think along those lines, when does salvation occur? You ever stopped and thought about that? When does salvation occur? I was just doing some reading and I found this and, and I hope I can frame it for you really well. But listen, this is it. It's far too many times we look at salvation as in the legal framework, almost like a court of law, instead of a covenant framework. Let me, what, let me tell you what I, what I mean by that is far too many times people look at salvation as being an insurance policy, which is a legal framework, instead of a married policy, you know, which is a covenant framework. What I mean by that, Suzanne and I just started today, we started our 29th year of marriage. Yesterday we celebrated 28 years. Uh, it, it's amazing how fast time goes by. Let me tell you this, and I quote, Suzanne said, we had, we've had 18 good years. That's what she told me last night at the supper table. And I said, but honey, we've been married 28. Does that mean 10 of them were bad? And she said, did I say that? And I said, I don't know what you said. You just said we were married at 18 years. I guess there's 10 others you want to forget. We had a good time with that, and she explained it all to me, and I still didn't understand it. But anyway, but let me tell you, 28 years and a day ago, I didn't make a legal agreement with Suzanne. Hmm. I made a covenant agreement with Suzanne. You let me tell you what I think about in marriage? If it becomes a legal agreement... You're in trouble. Huh? When it's a covenant agreement. Do you get this now? When it's a covenant agreement, I'm loving her like I love myself. If she wins, I win. Legal agreement says, hey, it's all about me. You're going to do this because you married me. Let me tell you something. If you've ever tried that, I guarantee you got bruises to remind you of that, don't you? Scars. You will do this. It doesn't work, turn out well. Think about that. There's a call. When I think about salvation, if we would realize instead of trying to this, that, and the other, all the legal wrangling about it, if we would realize the covenant that we have is that God loved us so much that he took my place on the cross and I'm just part of the agreement, the covenant with Almighty God that he did for me what I can't do. When we start that legal stuff, I think we're in trouble. There's the call for all. Listen to this. Think about it. I just want to share this with you. This is, it needs to be said. God does the knock and you and I open the door. But I want to remind you that 2 Corinthians, Paul said it this way. Today's the day of salvation. There's a call for all. He didn't die for some. He died for all of us. That's one aspect of picking up the phone. If you don't know him today, if you're uncertain today, I would love to talk to you about that. Because that's all, that's all that matters. Really, that's the number one thing is to know him. And it's not a legal knowing. It's a covenant. It's an agreement. We move on, but there's a call for all. Number two, there's a calling for you. There are times in our life, there are special times and occupations and callings that God has for us. And remember, remember this now, and what we've already shared in the text is the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. They're irrevocable. God knows what He's doing. I couldn't see it. Now, probably I can see better for grace than she can because all I do is stand off to the side and watch an 18-year-old. You are 18, aren't you? 17. A 17-year-old that is articulating to folks the love of God through Scripture and interpreting that and spent much time. And all i got to say is when I was 17, it wasn't happening. You hear me? But my first sermon was three minutes long when I was 17. I remember I wasn't speaking, but about 30 seconds, I looked down at my notes I had written out, and it said, Conclusion. Don't you know that's going to be a pretty bad day when the first thing you've really seen on your notes is conclusion? Don't you wish I could get there quicker these days, don't you? There's a calling for you. I received this a couple of years ago, and it's a, it's a great read. I don't read it every day. It's a devotional book. 
by Sarah Young. It says the title. I thought about it. I was putting a sermon together. It says, Jesus is calling. And you know what I found out about this devotional book? It's usually a verse of scripture or two, and it highlights that verse, and it just reminds me, and it's like I can speak, I can literally feel God in my spirit speaking to me. Jesus is calling. He still calls. Let me tell you this. He calls people (laughs) out of the ordinary into the extraordinary with God. Had a young man that was running from the call of his life years ago. He went down to an altar and he had down on his face before the Lord. And I just saw him and I went down to pray with him. I was asking him what is going on and this is what he said. And I quote, he said, I can't do it. I said, can't do what? He said, I can't do what God's called me to do. He's called me into ministry and I, I can't do it. And just like I'm standing before you, a verse came into my being. I knew it was a word of knowledge from God. And I said, let me tell you what the word of God says. The Word of God says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 25, verse 24. Chapter 5, verse 24, it says, Faithful is he who calleth you, who will also do it. See, today if God draws you to himself, don't excuse yourself because of age. Don't excuse yourself because of education. Don't excuse yourself because of your past. Today, if God calls us to something special, if he calls us out to do, maybe it's full-time Christian service or maybe it's just a minister and a season to someone, if God calls you out, let me tell you something, faithful is he who calls you who will also do it. Amen? Oh, listen, there's a calling. We need to understand it. That calling is specific. And I want to say this, and I need to say it because I've met so many. Where would I be today if I would told God no? Do I carry a heavy cross? You have no idea how heavy the cross is sometimes. You have no idea how real the enemy is. But let me tell you something. That pales in comparison to where I would be today if I'd have told God no. I will not celebrate the enemy anymore or not even close to how much I'll celebrate my Savior that trusts me enough to call me into ministry. Yeah, there's tough days, but there are also days I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else but four or five feet from Grace Self today sharing the call of God on her life with you. There's a calling. There's also, when I think about picking up the phone, I think there's callousness today. We can be so consumed and concerned about things that don't matter. This world. Listen, all that's going to matter one day is when it's all said and done. All that's going to matter is what was said and done with Jesus Christ. How far would you have to go in your life before you know somebody that doesn't know the Lord. How far? Hmm. Anybody here share a bed with one last night? How about share a house? How about your blood goes through their veins? They're part of your family, part of your extended family. They're going to be next to you in a cubicle at work tomorrow. You're going to work beside them. You live beside them. How far would you have to go? before you're pretty sure in your heart that there's somebody in your life that doesn't know Christ. And I want to ask you this question, talking about being callous. When was the last time it moved you?